All right, everybody, welcome back in. It's the 21 off season. It's the Kansas City Chiefs. Today we are talking about Noah Gray and Travis Kelsey and looking ahead at the 21 season and how those two tight ends might fit together and how they might fit into the rest of the offense. Hope you're doing well. We're using some old fashioned 1990s technology. My studio is under major reconstruction, probably be another year before it's actually finished. We hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to start by talking about Travis Kelsey because that's re really where everything from the tight end position is going to start and, and nothing that Noah Gray is going to do is really going to change anything that Travis Kelsey is going to do because you're not going to change anything that a great player like Kelsey can do in order to accommodate Noah Gray. But they will fit together and so we're going to talk about that, that today. Starting with Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey really operates for the most part. And again, this is percentages. This isn't every single play. But for the most part, Travis Kelsey likes to operate. If we were to put Travis Kelsey right here, and it really doesn't matter if you put him at the slot or the tight end position as far as where he generally likes to operate, usually he works from hash mark over to hash mark. That's generally, and again, that's not 100% of the time, but for the most part, that's where Kelsey likes to work, hash mark to hash mark. As far as depth percentage goes, usually for the most part, Travis Kelsey loves to operate right behind, just past the two linebackers, wherever they line up at. And usually that's somewhere within a five yard range of the line of scrimmage. Five yards here usually is about where they line up at. And he likes to operate all the way up to where the safety is lined up at. So if you can just imagine that rectangle right there, that is basically if you want to call it that, and you can, that is Kelsey world, okay? He loves to operate right in there. Now, he has a number of different ways of doing it, okay? He, of course, runs, he can run the seam route very well, does that effectively. He can shoot for the post, does that very effectively. What you see him do most often, if it's Travis Kelsey we're talking about, and, and, and this is something pretty unique really for him, he loves to operate right in here, it's not unusual to see him come all the way across the field before he catches the football. It's also not unusual to see him coming back the other direction <laughs> and just kind of operating in this area. But no matter, no matter where Kelsey lines up, for the most part, probably 85 to 90 percent of his catches, 85, probably even higher, probably 90 to 95 percent of his production, his yardage, comes right in this area. This is all Kelsey world right here. He usually, if, even if he catches the ball right here, it's usually right there at that linebacker depth, and he's splitting the linebackers, and he's very smooth. Kelsey does not usually break hard in and out of his routes, into his route or out of it. He's very smooth, and it's like this for most of the great athletes in basketball, in football, in hockey. They are very smooth. It's almost like watching an artist at work. It's almost like they have out a paint palette and they're just kind of taking their time and brushing it, and it looks so smooth, and it's so easy. Travis Kelsey really does not break in and out, and we're going to talk about that with Noah Gray here in a minute, and a lot of good receivers do break hard in and out, but Kelsey is so good at what he does, he really does not have hard breaks. It's very smooth. It's very poetic. It's, it's very snake-like almost, the rhythms that you see from Travis Kelsey. But no matter what routes he runs, and, and he runs a number of routes, and sometimes he does cut them off right here, sometimes he does flare out, but for the most part, all, almost 90% of his production comes right here in this rectangle. This is the area that he likes to work, and they don't really like to give Kelsey the ball down here below this level because it kind of limits his production. If they can get it to him right here at the linebacker spot or a little bit deeper, that's where he really starts to rack up the 12-yard catches and the 17-yard catches and he does it very well. And there's just almost nobody who can stick with him. He gets bracketed and double teamed, game in and game out, week in and week out. And he is just tremendous at what he does and so smooth. And this is Travis Kelsey world right here. That's the rectangle, okay? Now, if you'll give me just a second, I'm going to erase his routes because his routes at this point aren't really important. We're going to talk about Noah Gray, the fifth round draft pick. You know, I really did not expect the Chiefs to use a, a, a draft pick on tight end. They kind of surprised me with that. I talked about them uh, using, uh, using a little bit of cap space, maybe $5 million, anywhere from $1 million to $5 million 
in free agency, and I thought it was very important for them to go back and get a tight end for a couple of different reasons. I, I really felt like getting that second tight end would be an excellent insurance policy in case Travis Kelsey gets injured. And, of course, we, we realize Kelsey is playing right now at a Hall of Fame level. I'm not saying he's a lock forward or anything like that, but he's playing at that level and has been for several seasons now. And nobody is going to come in and, and come anywhere near replacing his production or his presence or his speed or his anything. So we understand that. But you would like to, if he does get injured at some point in this season or the following season, you would like to not have to throw out the entire tight end playbook and go completely with slot receivers. You would like to still have some presence at tight end. And so having another guy on the field who can catch the football does that. But also, and I thought this was important, especially if they were going to spend $5 million in cap space at the tight end two position, it was important to have a guy who could play with two tight ends on the field at the same time. And you start to create size disadvantages and, and mismatches with some of the smaller defensive backs when you put that second tight end on the field. So when they didn't do that in free agency, I knew the tight end position wasn't very deep in the draft this year. A lot of other positions were. I really did not think that they were going to draft a tight end. They wound up drafting Noah Gray there, I think, in the fifth round. And I really like it because it's actually a better option than what I was suggesting in free agency because it saves you about $5 million a season. Even if you found somebody who was a pretty good second tight end later on in his career, some kind of a veteran, this saves you a lot of money. Uh, 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 Noah Gray is going to come in and be making somewhere around eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000 a year, and he's going to do that for the most of his career, for, for the first four years of his career. He's going to be making somewhere around a million dollars a season. So if he produces anything at all, if he gets on the field at all, you're saving a ton of money versus what you would have done in free agency. So they surprised me a little bit by doing that in the draft, but I love it. It was an excellent decision. Whether they had gone with Noah Gray or not, we'll talk about him specifically, just to draft at the tight end position and try to get somebody in there who actually can catch the football, uh, that was important. And I thought they did an excellent job with drafting tight end, period, in the draft. Now let's talk about Noah Gray. There's, there's a lot of things floating around about Noah Gray. Most of it is true. Some of it I don't quite line up with. I'm a little off axis with some of it, but we're going to talk about that in depth today. Noah Gray can line up in a number of different positions. That's probably the thing you've heard about most from him, his flexibility. He can line up right here in the fullback position. He can line up, of course, in the tight end spot. He can line up in, in what I would really call two slot positions. Really, there's a tight slot and a loose slot. So he can line up right here just off the line of scrimmage as what I would call a tight slot receiver. And then he can line up out here where Travis Kelsey likes to line up, which is more of a loose, wide slot, kind of a hybrid position, if you will. Now, Noah Gray can line up as a slot receiver. In fact, I think he caught 29 passes in 2020 for Duke, and 22 of those were from the slot position. That probably is also a statistic that you've heard, and you've probably heard a lot made of his flexibility. In reality, though, that's a little bit tricky. That's a, that's a little bit deceiving, and here's why. Most of Noah Gray's production, no matter where he lines up at, whether it's a fullback, whether it's tight end, whether it's a tight slot or a wide slot, most of his production comes right here, just beneath the two linebackers. And usually in the ACC and, and most football places, usually that's about five-yard depth. And about 85 to 90 percent of his catches and of his yardage, for the most part, took place right below, right below the two linebackers, right in front of, and that's on purpose. Usually when he's coming out of, and I'm, I'm going to move him around a little bit here, so let's erase him out of the slot for right now, and let's put him over here at the tight end position. This is Noah Gray. If he lines up right here at tight end, and, and by the way, if some of you are trying to figure out what my X's and O's are, are lined up, they are not exactly in proportion, so we're just focusing on the tight end routes here today with Kelsey and Gray. If Noah Gray lines up right here at tight end, most of the time, more often than not, he is simply going to do a five-yard in route, just like that. That's usually what he's going to do. That's usually where he'll catch the ball, more often than not. Now, if we were to move him out of here, I'm going to leave that there just so you can see what his most pattern is, but if, if you were to move him out of here, 
And now we've got 12 X's on the board, but realize this is just Noah Gray in two different spots. If you were to put him right here at the wide slot position, his, his two most basic routes out of that are a post route, which he ran a lot, but he did not actually catch the ball much on these post routes. When he did catch them, it was usually for a pretty nice 10 to 12 yard gain. But it very rarely did Noah Gray actually beat defenders to catch the ball on a post route out of this wide slot. Usually they were breaking up a zone right here between the safety, the defensive back, and the linebackers. Usually there was some kind of a zone, and usually the quarterback spotted it, and he would catch the ball right here for about 10 to 12 yards, okay? So when he lines up in the slot, He's usually not going to be able. He just doesn't have the speed or the athleticism. This is where it gets tricky. He does not have the speed or the athleticism of Travis Kelsey, of course, but he also doesn't have the speed or the athleticism to beat NFL defensive backs. As a matter of fact, athletically, he's going to be about on an even par with a lot of NFL linebackers and not even with the best of them, okay? So he's not traditionally going to beat defensive backs in one-on-one -on -one coverage. When he did catch the ball out of the slot, it was usually on a post route and it was usually to get, just break up a zone, to get in between a zone between the linebacker and the defensive back. That's almost every time, I don't want to say every time, but almost every time that's what was happening right there. So it's not as if he was just so athletic that he was beating defensive backs here, but he was able to beat the zone, okay? The other thing that he would usually do out of this wide, this wide slot right here is he would just break right out into this exact same in route from that slot position, that wide slot position. He would just break right into that five-yard in route, and that five-yard in route is his staple. If you had to put one thing on him, the thing that he does the most, it's a five-yard in route. No questions asked from any position, fullback, tight end slot, wide slot, tight slot, doesn't matter. His number one thing that he does, Noah Gray, you'll see it right here. And, 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 and so if Kelsey's off the field, it's a whole different discussion about what they're going to try to ask Noah Gray to do. Hopefully that time doesn't come, okay? Hopefully uh, Travis Kelsey is on the field all the time. <laughs> for the next five years at his usual level of greatness. But if Travis Kelsey is on the field and they're in two tight ends set, it doesn't change at all what Travis Kelsey does because Travis Kelsey operates right here in this rectangle, which is usually in the seven to 15 yard range. And Noah Gray usually operates right here below the linebackers. You could almost think of it as Travis Kelsey being a very tall pine tree and Noah Gray kind of operating in the underbrush, if you will the underbrush of a forest. And I do not expect that to change for at least the first couple of seasons of Noah Gray being here for the Chiefs. This is where uh, Noah Gray loves to operate right there, okay? That's his standard spot. You don't see him run seam very much. As a matter of fact, one of Noah Gray's weaknesses, and we'll talk about his strengths, we'll even get to the grades here in a minute. One of Noah Gray's weaknesses is after about 10 yards of running a route, whether it's up, straight, whatever, he kind of looks like he doesn't know what to do, probably because he hasn't done it very much, okay? Duke had the wide receivers that ran the deep routes. Noah Gray pretty much just ran this stuff and the post. Now, if Noah Gray lines up in what we call a tight slot, I'm going to call it a tight slot. You may have a different term for it. If he were to line up right here, and I hope I'm not kicking off anybody's OCD now that I have 13 X's on the board, okay? But we're moving Noah Gray around. If Noah Gray lines up right here in the tight slot, again, he always, 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 always has this as his main option. And that is five-yard in route, five-yard in route, okay? Number one option every time. But the other thing that he can do, and he's athletic enough to do this, is a wheel route. Just simply zipping out right here. You see your running backs do this a lot. Slot receivers do it sometimes. He's athletic enough to do it, but usually, and, and, and you could see this against uh, Wake Forest. He, he did this against Notre Dame. Um, Wake Forest was in 2019, Notre Dame 2020. When he does this, usually it's because the defense has just lost track of him altogether. Usually they're not expecting him to zip out on the wheel route. When he did do that, usually it's because they were playing a zone and the linebacker or the defensive back, whoever was supposed to be kind of watching that zone or that player just completely lost track of him. 
So he didn't do this a lot, but when he did it and they hit him for it, it was usually because the defense forgot about him. And that's a wheel route that you might see him run sometimes, probably not too often. He didn't run it a whole lot at Duke. He really didn't run that a lot. So when they talk about flexibility for Noah Gray, yes, he has it, but it's a little bit limited. And his best spot is tight end by far. That's where he can operate the best. And no matter where he lines up at, you're always going to see five-yard in route, five-yard in route right here in front of the linebackers. And, and that's really his staple by far. Now, what if he lines up at fullback? <laughs> and now I'm really <laughs> hoping I'm not blowing anybody up now. I've got 14 X's on the offensive side of the football, okay? If, no, if we move, if we erase all of this and Noah Gray moves to fullback, again, there's about two routes that he runs, okay? Number one is he just comes right back up here, five-yard in route from the fullback spot, but more likely, and this is what you see from a lot of running backs, no matter how good they are, just quite simply, he's going to flare out here and just flare out into, into the flat, basically is what he's going to do. And he did do that a good bit as well. But by far, I would say 85, 90% of the time, it's this zone right here. It's right in front of your two linebackers. It's a five-yard in route. It's very effective. Um, the player that he really reminds me the most of is an undrafted rookie free agent for the Packers in 2020, a guy named Robert Tanyan, I believe is his name. Uh, Tanyan really exploded. I, I think it was for something like 700, 800 yards for the Packers last year. Had a ton of catches. I, it made 50, 60 catches. Aaron Rodgers absolutely loved him. Uh, defenses, as a lot of NFL defenses are these days, were so focused on the Packers' deep threat and on Aaron Rodgers being able to just bomb the ball all over the football field that basically Robert Tanyan had free lunches all day long for the Packers last year operating right here in the flats, right here in this flat, and operating on the in routes, just the ends and the flats. That was it. Robert Tanyan didn't usually, and he could, there were times where he would go seam route or deep, deep out, but for the most part, last year, Robert Tanyan for the Packers made a living. I mean, just had an absolute field day, and a lot of his catches were completely unguarded. He really wasn't being guarded by anybody. He was just feasting on this underneath stuff, okay? And that's really what Noah Gray reminds me of. When I, when I watch him at Duke and when I project where he might fit in the Kansas City Chiefs offense, I just don't see him doing much of what Travis Kelsey can do. I'll come back to that point. I'll save that for the end. I do want to talk about the grades, and then we'll come back and talk about Noah Gray a little bit more in those regards. His route running, you've probably heard a good bit about that. His route running, I would put that at a B. He's very precise with his routes. Now, he doesn't run a lot of them, but he's very precise with his break points. When he, he's, he's excellent at reaching a point and breaking in, breaking out. His plant foot is very strong. It's very precise. Now, I mentioned earlier, Travis Kelsey doesn't actually do that. Travis Kelsey does not usually break in and break out of his routes very precisely. It's not unusual. We mentioned it for Travis Kelsey to just kind of be floating along almost as if he's on skates on ice. You don't see a lot of hard breaks from Travis Kelsey, but you did see it from Noah Gray when he was at Duke University. Excellent break in, break out, and he has to have it because the other grades we're going to see, he really doesn't have any other way to separate himself from even college-level defensive backs and linebackers, much less NFL level linebackers and defensive backs and I'm not knocking that because that's about what you expect from a fifth round draft pick you don't expect first round athleticism or top 50 athleticism from a fifth round draft pick and certainly we're not getting it from Gray I want to talk about his hands for a second his hands are excellent and some of you might prefer to talk about his focus actually give me a second some of you may prefer to talk about his focus but he basically has B plus hands. If he can get his hands on it, usually uh, he's going to catch the football. It is amazing. We saw this against Alabama, and I can't remember if it was 2020 or 2019, but we've seen it against a number of players. It was not unusual for Noah Gray to have a linebacker basically draped all over him and for him to actually win the battle and catch the football. His hands and his focus are outstanding. It is probably his single best feature. I think it is by far his best feature. 
even better than his route running to me. I think that his ability to focus on the football and to get his hands on it and to actually catch it, it, it was to me it was profound because there were so many times where he caught the football and he literally has a linebacker basically sitting right on his shoulder fighting for the football as well. Now in the NFL, he won't be able to do that as much on these deeper routes because the defensive backs are just too quick and they also have too good of hands, okay? Some of these defensive backs in the NFL are almost like college wide receivers. Their ability to ball hawk and get after it. If, if Patrick Mahomes, and he won't, Patrick Mahomes is too good and too smart for this, but if Pat, Patrick Mahomes is trying to get the ball here to Noah Gray on some of these deeper routes against NFL defensive backs who are insanely fast and who also have excellent hands, those are pick sixes waiting to happen, okay? So we're not going to see too much of that, all right? We may see a little bit, we're not going to see a lot of it. But in this area right here, and by the way, in the red zone, I think Noah Gray, I think he projects to be an excellent, excellent weapon. He is perfectly comfortable catching the ball in traffic. He's perfectly comfortable moving through traffic, and he stays focused. And he is perfect, absolutely perfect, for goal line and red zone situations. He is outstanding at that. When everything is compacted, this is the perfect place for him. You don't have to take Travis Kelsey off the field. You simply add on Noah Gray is absolutely perfect for that. Now, that brings me to the stuff that I'm gonna talk about why his flexibility is really kind of limited and why his coming out of the slot is a little bit deceptive and tricky. Speed one, that's basically his 40 line, his, his straight line 40 time is just average, it's pedestrian, it's sea level. For college level athletes, it might have been a little bit above average, but that's it. When you, as soon as you transplant him in the NFL, his 40 time is his straight line speed is just very pedestrian. He is not going to be able to beat defensive backs up the field on the seam route. He, he will be able to break up a zone if he runs that post, but that's it, okay? He's just not gonna be able, he doesn't have it. And you don't expect that from a fifth round draft pick. He does not have that, okay? I can't say that strongly enough. Yes, he's flexible. Yes, he's lined up in different positions. He does not have the speed to beat defensive backs at the NFL level. He simply does not have that. What he also doesn't have, and I'm not trying to be critical here, but I'm trying to be honest and fair with these grades, the speed two, and that is a speed burst. That is speed in and out. You know, when he stops and changes direction, again, it's not bad, but for tight end, NFL tight end, it's just average, it's pedestrian. There's nothing to write home about. He's not particularly bad at it. He's not particularly good at it. It's very average, so he's not necessarily going to be able to create a ton of separation. He didn't do it at the college level. A lot of the passes that he called, again, there were basically two categories of passes that he called. Number one, it was just where a zone, he found a seam in the zone, and he was wide open, and the other kinds of passes that he called were with somebody hanging all over him, and he's the one who came up with the football. So if he couldn't do it at the, at the college level speed-wise, I would not project him to be able to do that at the NFL level. All of a sudden, to just get faster. I don't see that happening. So speed, whether it's straight line speed or whether it's change of direction, speed burst, he's basically a C in that area as well. Now his jumping, again, when you look at his draft measurables, and you can look at the numbers, either one, you can look at the draft measurables, or you can look, just watch the film. For those of you who don't want to pay for it, you can find some of the stuff on YouTube. Um, you, you can just see it. His jumping ability is fine. Um, he, he's got pretty long arms. His jumping ability is fine. It's not bad. It's fine. It's not great. It's not going to beat a lot of guys. Keep in mind, a lot of the linebackers that he's going to be going up against are just as athletic as he is, okay? So he's not going to find a lot of more success from that standpoint. So this is all C stuff. When it comes to athleticism, it's C level. What makes him an NFL prospect is that he is at least C level in these areas, plus his hands are outstanding, plus his routes are outstanding, okay? So that's what makes him an NFL prospect and a very legit NFL prospect. <laughs> I'm sorry, my cat is coming in here and devastating everything. <laughs> I'm too deep in to edit that out, okay? All right. Um, on the blocking side of things, you know, I saw quite a few articles written about him that said he was good at blocking. That's only half true. His blocking skills are, are really pedestrian again. 
And, and the reason why that's so, from a blocking standpoint, is that when he blocks, he does an excellent job of putting helmet on helmet. He always finds his man. I mean, almost 98, 100% of the time, he finds his man on defense that he's supposed to be guarding, and he gets helmet on helmet almost every single time. He's very diligent about that. He's very intelligent about that. But what he doesn't have is staying power. He simply cannot, at least at the college level, he did not sustain those blocks. He was largely, and again, this is 90% of the time, he was largely unable to sustain those blocks. It was very normal, whether it was a linebacker or a defensive end, to see them slip off of his block and simply move away from that and move on. Could he get a helmet on a helmet? Yes, almost every time. And could he get in the way? Yes, but he was almost never able to sustain those blocks. That's something he can actually get better at, the blocking, if he wants to. If he puts in the time, I think he needs to maybe get a little bit more muscle, a little bit more strength. I think he needs to get a little bit more leverage, a little bit better footwork, a little bit better technique. The guys in the NFL can offer him that if that's something he wants to work on. But again, the blocking was suspect at times, not because he's not trying and not because he's not getting helmet on helmet and not because he's not getting to the right spot. You can check the boxes on all of that. What he doesn't have is that staying power. He just simply is not able at this point to sustain those blocks and to keep that blocker occupied until the quarterback has released the football or until the running back has hit the hole, either one, okay? So all of these are C levels. The blocking can be improved. I don't think you're going to see the speed of the jumping develop too much, but the routes and the hands are very good. The hands are just excellent, excellent. So when you come back over here, after saying all of that, we've handed out the grades. What do we really expect out of Noah Gray? I figure, and again, with fifth round draft picks, there's always a question of, are they actually even good enough to be on the NFL football field or not? It, can they even get on the football field? Sometimes, and again, they're not providing depth until they get on the football field and play meaningful snaps. Until then, they're just a name taking up a spot on the roster. But I think with Noah Gray, I think we've seen enough out of him, and I think Kansas City made a good pick here. I think in his first season, you'll probably see him come in on goal line, probably come in late in the game for some of Travis Kelsey's, save, save some time on him, probably see him in some third and shorts, probably see him in a few other snaps. If Kelsey gets injured, he can step in right away and play. You know, it's not going to hurt anything for a couple of games. You wouldn't want that during the playoffs, but for a couple of games during the regular season, that would be fine. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to see him get on the field for maybe 200 snaps this year. Uh, Kelsey's probably going to play 1,000 snaps, 1,100 snaps if he's healthy. Wouldn't surprise me for Noah Gray to get on the field for 200 snaps. Where is he going to operate again? We saw this at Duke. It's not going to change for Kansas City five-yard in routes and out routes. That's what you're going to see from him. Probably mostly from the tight end spot. Can he line up in slot? Yes, absolutely he can, but there's really no reason for him to do that. Kansas City has plenty of guys who can play slot. The only reason to put him in a slot is if you want to go four or five wide at goal line or on short, uh, you know, third and short, and you just want to get the ball to a tall receiver, and he is that. He's 6'3", 6'4", something like that, depending on which website you believe. So he is significantly taller than your average defensive back. You can get that height advantage, but you wouldn't want to do that when you're on the 50-yard line or the 40-yard line with all that space to operate because you have other guys who are way faster and can operate perfectly fine within that slot position, whether Tyreek Keel is lining up at slot or whether Mecole Hardman is lining up in slot, or whether Robinson is lining up in slot. You've got tons of guys who can do that, uh, or Kelsey <laughs> slot. So there, yes, he could line up at slot, but really he cannot do. And, and I'm going to close with this. I, I said this for the last. I, I'm a little bit off axis with a couple of the articles that I've read out there, and even, unfortunately for me, I guess, I'm a little off, off axis with what I've heard from a couple of guys in the Chiefs scouting department, and, and that is, the idea that Kels, uh, that uh, Gray can actually run some of the routes that Kelsey can run. That's really kind of sort of not true. The only thing that Gray can do that Kelsey does really is just the post, okay? And again, he's not going to beat anybody that way. He just might find a, a soft spot in the zone from that post position. 
and a, the occasional wheel route. But again, that's only if the defense has completely forgotten about him. He does not have, I cannot stress this enough, he does not have the athletic ability to consistently beat defensive backs down here in the second level the way Kelsey does. Kelsey can be anybody in this rectangle spot, absolutely anybody, and he does it in, in rather a unique way. There's not too many guys in the NFL who do what Kelsey does. There's a few. He's got one on his team with Tyreek Hill who can do it, but there's not too many guys who can operate right here in Kelsey world the way Travis does. Noah Gray is right down here, okay, and, and this, is a, this is about where he is. So when you're talking about flexibility and coming out of the slot, yes, it's true, but it's a little bit tricky. Almost everything we've talked about here, it's going to be kept short. And the, the occasional, he'll go, listen, he'll go out here for post and for wheel about as often as Travis Kelsey drops below the, uh, the five-yard line here and the, um, the two-linebacker line, if you will, okay? Not very often, just often enough to kind of mix it up. But this basically is going to be Noah Gray's world right here, at least for the next couple of seasons. They'll probably teach him better how to run the out routes than he did at Duke. He'll probably run those a little bit more similar to what you see Robert Tanyan at for the Packers. All right, we've spent 30 minutes on this. If you're still hanging around, <laughs> thank you very much. I hope you're doing well. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.